take an ounce of gall nuts, crushed into little pieces, then put into a linen cloth. Tie it up, but not too tightly. Leave to soak for at least six days in 12 ounces of rainwater. Next, boil until it reduces down to eight ounces. Strain and add a quarter ounce of German vitriol, ground to a fine powder, and half an ounce of gum arabic, steeped in vinegar, and you will make a wondrously good ink. That is a 16th century writing ink recipe according to the archives of the Victoria and Albert Museum. This ink in particular is written by Ugo da Carpi. It was written in, well, it was at least found and recorded in 1535, which, of course, once I read it, I just had to try it out. You guys know I have been interested in doing uh, another, more variations of ink since I made the natural inks video, which was probably about two years ago already, so we are way past due to try to make more ink. And I wanted the next time I make ink to be something that's a bit more permanent, and I don't mean just in terms of uh, the finish of the ink, I mean in terms of something that I can save and use in the future and will not grow mold or separate too much like the natural inks do. They are very fun to play with, but unfortunately they don't last in the bottle for many years to come, right? They, uh, the properties of it change given the natural nature of it. So even though this book is not necessarily meant as a recipe book, there's some stuff there that involves, you know, roasting 18 toads in the sunlight and turning them into powder. So this is not exactly a recipe book, this is more of a research book, but I figured this one in particular is something that can very much work in today's world with today's available materials. So I did try to keep it as close as possible and it was, it was pretty close to the original um, recipe that Ugo gives us. So the first thing I did was to order oak galls. I wish I could say I gathered them, but I live in Chicago. I don't know where to find oak trees that have oak galls. So I ordered them online and they arrived. They took a little longer because I ordered them from the other side of the world because it's what I found, but I am really happy with the ones I got. I have also heard oak galls be referred to as oak apples, which I thought was interesting. The book also mentions in parentheses the word gall nuts. So that's another reference that you can use in order to find this ingredient. So essentially what these are, they're these little balls that grow in oak trees when a certain type of wasp lays eggs on a branch of the tree. Hello, Lolo. The tree then responds to the presence of these eggs with the growth of oak galls around the egg. So it's essentially a kind of parasite, I guess we could call it that. Wasps eventually do escape from that ball, so the oak tree is unfortunately not getting what it wanted. <laughs> the wasp continues to grow successfully and eventually makes a little hole through the oak gall to escape. So that's how you know they are ready for harvest. You will see the little hole, that means the wasp already escaped and you are free to take it without the fear of killing any insects. Because you have this wasp growing inside of this shell, it is loaded with tannic acid, which is what we are using in this recipe to give the dark tinted color to the ink. Later on, through the fermentation process, which is when the gall nuts are sitting in the rainwater for at least six days, according to Ugo, this process transforms that tannic acid to gallic acid, which combined with the iron sulfate, which we will talk about very shortly, produces the black color in the ink. The next ingredient that the recipe requires is German vitriol. Now, this was the older name for it. This product in particular actually has an array of names, so you have so many ways to call it, pick your favorite, but it is also referred to as green vitriol. It is, it is also referred to as iron sulfate, or more specifically, iron two sulfate. It was also very commonly called at the time as copperas, which is actually the most interesting part of the name because calling it copperas, first of all, makes it sound like it has copper, which it doesn't. But secondly, it created a very funny, well, funny now for us, confusion in the medieval times because both copper sulfate and iron sulfate used to be mined in the same areas. They were actually very common 
commonly mined in Spain. That was apparently the place to go if you needed copperas. People sometimes didn't really know what they were buying in terms of how much iron sulfate and how much copper sulfate, the way we call it now, was in each, in the batch. So that essentially meant that if you had less iron sulfate and more copper sulfate content, your ink would be less dark in color. It would create, apparently, I haven't tried it myself, but according to some research, it would create more of a brownish color, which is not what the standard was. It's not what people wanted. So I imagine just thinking of how it must have looked like at the time, if you don't know what the iron slash copper content in your copperas is, as a maker, as a vendor, you just somehow base it on where you get it from. And where you get it from is because that area just so happens to have more iron sulfate content. If you want to recreate this recipe and want to look for the right ingredients, I suggest just looking for iron to sulfate for this ingredient or green vitriol, that you can find it that way as well. Avoid looking for blue vitriol. If you see that, that is actually copper sulfate. So run away from that one or, you know, or don't. Try it and let's see what happens. I'm probably gonna do it. The next ingredient that we're using is rainwater. I actually stuck to this and harvested rain in my very urban porch because it's all I got. So it took me a few days to gather enough to make two batches. So I wanted to gather 24 ounces in order to try two different things, which we will talk about very shortly. The reason why rainwater is requested in this recipe is because at the time coming across clean water was very difficult. Not everybody had access to clean purified water. So of course, rainwater was the way to go. Now we have distilled water, so we don't necessarily need to harvest rainwater for it, but I want to keep it to the recipe. And actually it's not so bad. I just started to become hyper aware of checking the weather and when it's about to rain, I just put out my container <laughs> or my jars to collect the rainwater. And it just eventually you realize, oh, I have enough to make another couple batches. So it works out. And then finally, we need some gum arabic. Now, I used this in my previous video when making natural inks as the main binder. I just have it in powdered form, which worked very well. So you can definitely use that. You can also try it out with natural binders, which people used to do. Honey was actually a very common binder to use. I don't know what the measurements would be for that, but that would be a very cool thing to experiment with. Also, egg whites used to be uh, a common binder. However, of course, if you can avoid food, or at least if you want your ink to last, that would be better because food brings mold eventually. Now on to the actual process of making the ink. The first thing I did was to crush the oak galls and with a mortar and pestle. These made it fly away. I was very tempted to just put it in a Ziploc bag and crush them there. But again, trying to keep with historical accuracy, there were no Ziploc bags. So mortar and pestle it is. And once I crushed it into down to a size that I felt I was satisfied with, I didn't even really know how far to go. It just got to a point where I just felt like, you know what, this this seems reasonable. So you'll see when that point was, of course, in the video. And then from there, I wanted to try two different ways of soaking in the water. So the recipe calls for wrapping it in linen and tying it, but not too tightly. I, I thought that part of the recipe was funny. So I definitely wanted to follow up with that process. However, I did do quite a bit of uh, research online of other people who have done this and nobody seems to be using the linen. So I decided to also make a second batch without the linen and just simply having the galls be in there swirling around swimming in the water. So this is my variable, I guess, between the two batches and the one thing that differs from the two of them. So I soaked each one of these batches of gall nuts into their respective mason jars, very historically accurate, filled with 12 ounces of rainwater and closed them up and put them away. I put them in the dark. The recipe didn't specifically call for putting them in the dark, but I figured it is a sort of fermentation process. So it just makes sense and patiently waited six days to take them out. Now, I definitely looked at them every so often, but I would say after the first 24 to 48 hours, the color didn't really change much in the water. 
I am assuming that the reason why this recipe calls for a minimum of six days is not necessarily because you'll get more color out of it. You will simply get more of that tannin acid out of the gallnuts into the water so that it ideally results in a deeper black color. It's actually not very interesting to be looking at it every day because it looks pretty much the same after the point when you're, of course, taking it out towards the end of the week that I had them fermenting, it started growing mold. And I actually didn't realize <laughs> until, because I stopped looking at it halfway through the week because I realized, well, nothing's changing. So you'll notice once I reach in to take them out, it, to my surprise, had, I don't know if it's mold, but it looks like mold. I still don't know what it is, but I made sure to filter that out because I definitely didn't want some flowery looking layer in my final ink. All right, so a whole week has passed. So now we get to finally look at, oh, is that mold supposed to be there? <laughs> okay, well, I am, um, well, we can definitely, uh filter this out but this is what the jars look like they've been here for exactly seven days it looks um it looks a little disgusting <laughs> let's see the other one so that was the one that i didn't use the linen cloth in and this one this is the one where i did this one also has mold or what looks like mold i'm not actually completely sure but we will open them in a second. After the six days were over, I filtered out all of the gall nuts and the mold <laughs> and the linen and everything that I had going on in that water just to have the liquid by itself. All right, so we have transferred over to my kitchen where we're going to filter out what we have so far. I am going to use some cheesecloth, which I am not sure if it is completely historically accurate, but it is what I have, so it should work. Now, here's where I noticed the first difference between using the linen cloth to wrap the galnas and not using anything and just having them floating in the water, which is the sediment. With the linen jar, I only had to filter it once. I filter out the mold, I filter out any little pieces of sediment that could have come out of the out of the linen pouch and that was it. And it was very clear, it was very easy to make. The other one, I can't remember exactly how many times I filtered it, but it was pretty much almost before every single step. I was filtering again and filtering again, and I noticed that it never got as clear or as uh, seamless, as sediment-less as the jar with the linen pouch. So for that reason already, it makes me want to continue making it with the linen because it just creates a purer ink. If it does, if, of course, if it has less sediment, it's just less to shake later, less to pay attention to. I actually noticed that this one, which is the jar that had, that did not have the linen, so just the gallon that's floating around, has more liquid, which I think that makes sense because, of course, the linen cloth would have absorbed some of the water. However, this one, which is the one that had the linen cloth, is clearer. It's just, let me raise the angle for just a moment. There you can see my entire kitchen. <laughs> so if you look at them, there's definitely some sediment in the bottom here. Let's see if you can see that there. It's quite visible right here. There's a cloud of sediment. This one, on the other hand, does not have that or has much less it has a little bit as you can see but far less than the other one the most important thing is i didn't notice an, an actual difference in terms of the quality of the ink between the two jars it was equal quality equal color payoff there wasn't more color on the one without the linen as i thought for some reason would happen it was actually the same it makes the same ink simply one takes more work in removing sediment and it's very difficult to get it 
all out. Now came the boiling process. Now the reason for boiling some water off of the mixture it's simply to condense the acids that are going on in the water. The only thing that evaporates is the water, so then you have a more condensed mixture. After the boiling process, this is where the really fun part begins, which is adding the iron sulfate. And it was just so cool to watch. <laughs> I loved it. It's immediate. I don't know why it was just surprise even though I did research on this so I knew it what happened but I was just so surprised of how immediate it turns black and you just you can see the black taking over you know what it reminds me of it reminds me I don't know if you guys saw once upon a time the the fairy tale tv series and sometimes you would have that evil cloud of darkness taking over the entire town that's what it looks like you feel like an evil wizard and it was great okay it is the moment of truth i have both of my jars of gallnut infused rainwater and here i have the german vitriol also known as iron sulfate and the recipe calls for a uh, quarter of an ounce of the german vitriol so i converted it thanks to google to tablespoons and that should be about half a tablespoon okay I'm very excited about this, guys. <laughs> I've been waiting a week for this. All right, so let's go with this one first, which is the one without the linen. Oh my God, that is so cool. <laughs> Look at that. It turns black immediately. So if I grab it, it is already black. Oh no, oh no, no cats with ink making chemicals. The cats are safe. <laughs> All right, so that is pretty black. That is so cool. Okay, we still need to add the gum arabic right after, but first let's add the German vitriol to this one. And then it's just time to add the gum arabic. Now, I also wasn't clear in terms of the recipe on how to add the gum arabic, if I should steep it in vinegar first and then add the mixture or simply add everything. It made sense that based on what the, the wording of the recipe that it should be steeped in vinegar first. So I did this with the linen batch to keep it, that being already the batch that was more accurate to the to Ugo's recipe. And then for the other batch, I simply added the uh, elements separately. What I did for the measurement of the vinegar is simply do a one-to-one -one ratio with uh, of um, gum arabic to vinegar. And then the purpose of the vinegar is to make it last. It's simply a way for it to, to avoid growing mold. Actually, a lot of people used to use red wine for this. But for now, I had white vinegar very accessible, so I just went with that. This looks a little nasty, to be honest. <laughs> Many things in this project do, clearly. So now I'm just going to pour it in the ink. Now, once again, I didn't really notice a difference between steeping the gum arabic and the vinegar first or just adding them separately. So I'm probably in the future going to just continue steeping it. For the other one, I am simply adding the gum arabic directly to the jar. Now notice I am not using a spoon or anything to mix this with because given the acidity of this mixture, it can eventually cause rust in anything metal. So I'm avoiding all metal. Of course, the lids in these jars are metal, but I am willing to sacrifice those. I would rather not sacrifice a perfectly good spoon from my kitchen. Okay, so now that that's mixed, it's time to add the vinegar to this one, which we are adding separately. Now, of course, we get to the fun part of trying the ink. Many sources online do recommend waiting 24 hours in order to then use your ink. I started using it right away because honestly, I just couldn't wait. I did wait a little bit for it to cool down because it was still very warm from the boiling, but I would say in like within half an hour, I was just using it and it worked fine. It was okay. I did use it again after the 24 hours were done and it wasn't much of a difference. I, don't, I didn't really notice a difference. So go for it. Use it right away as far as I'm concerned. I am warning you 
this is a slightly messy process that will definitely stain your fingers <laughs> but anything for art right okay it does smell a little vinegary but that's okay the moment of truth here's my ink so the consistency right off the bat feels a little watery so maybe that means it needs perhaps more gum arabic but let's just try it out on paper and see how it turns out gonna take a break from the music to bring this camera closer because you need to see how dark this is <laughs> it is so cool this is really dark just when you put it in sorry about the noises outside I say that every video when you put it on the paper it seems to be too watery and not at all as black as I expected but then it just turns black as it's on the paper. So in terms of how the ink writes, it is stunning. It's really funny because at first when you put it down, it looks watery. So I was, for the first like split second, I was a little disappointed. I was like, oh no, I did something wrong. It's not very dark and those manuscripts look very dark. And then it just darkens within a few seconds right in front of your eyes. It's just like magic. You first get some like muttery, kind of nasty looking water and then it's just, it's just black it's pitch black and it was amazing to watch the flow of it was very good i used it with my usual manuscript calligraphy nib and then now that we're talking about the nib i do want to talk about some of the drawbacks of using iron gall ink now because of the nature of how we have made this ink it is extremely acidic which causes many problems, especially in terms of longevity of the document. The funny thing about this is that it's not very consistent. So some manuscripts have survived hundreds of years impeccable and have no problems, while others have their pages being corroded and they need a restoration to in order to combat that acidity. I guess if you, what you're writing, if you want it to last 500 years, maybe don't use the sink. But if you're just, you know, doing something for fun or you're going to make copies of it or you don't have, you know, realistically most things won't survive anyway, this does save you the water damage of things. So that's a big one. It is very waterproof. So at least your lifetime and probably your children and your grandchildren's lifetimes, it'll be perfectly fine. However, you do want to be aware of what kind of nib you use for this. Of course, this was made when we were still using feather quills. So it wasn't, you still had to sharpen those all the time. Uh, with metal nibs, of course, we use them over and over again, and eventually you do have to throw it out because it becomes rusty, but this particular ink will corrode your metal nibs faster. It will definitely not be a nib that you use for a very long time. So you'll see me use a nib that was actually already on its way out, that I had already used for a bit too long and was definitely time to get replaced. So I figured if I'm going to replace this one anyway, I'm going to use it with the nib killing ink and not worry about it. But for example, if you have really nice nibs, specialty nibs, vintage nibs, I wouldn't use it for that. I, for example, have my music sheet pentagram making nib with the three point, with the five points. Uh, but I only have one of those and I'm not even sure how to get a hold of another one right now. So maybe that's, this is not an ink that I will be using with that nib until I get some extra ones. But for the usual nibs that you use, if 
at least in my case, I have yeah. multiples of them because I know I go through them. I am not too concerned about having it corrode. And then while we're talking about corroding metals, this of course applies to all metal uh, stationary items. So this also applies to inkwells. Now, personally, I use a ceramic inkwell, which I have right here. My roommate actually made this for me. She's a ceramicist. So I, oh, months ago, maybe longer than that, I asked her to make me a few inkwells because I thought it would be a cool thing to have, to have inkwells made by her. So those are fine because that's ceramic, it will be okay. Also glass, this is also a reason why I use the mason jars. Glass will be perfectly fine, but maybe don't use your nice metallic or metal, copper, brass uh, inkwells for this. They might slash will get ruined. So now for one of the very exciting parts about this video is I have decided to actually start selling this Iron Gal ink that I am making. I will continue making this. I loved the process. I want to continue experimenting with it as well. I wanna, I really wanna try to make red ink. That was a very popular color in manuscripts. I would like to try making blue, which was another one that was used. And I want to sell them and I want this to be a product that I make. I've been wanting to, to make a product of sorts, like a stationary slash calligraphy slash historical writing and materials product for a very long time and I just haven't decided on something and this is going to be the one that starts this and launches this. So eventually I would like to open an Etsy store or an online store of sorts but for now I will stick to selling the ones, the batches that I have right now through my Instagram. What I am going to do in order to start this off is I will be selling the this first batch of the of the iron gall ink at half of the price that i will be selling it after this why because it's the first batch right so i still don't have any feedback other than what i have found and my roommate and another friend of mine who have tried it they love it so i hope you guys love it as well i will be selling 12 of these each one of them will be in a jar with a dropper let me show you actually i have them right here they are already packaged, so you would get this 30 ml jar, comes with a dropper, let me show you. So you can easily take your ink out of it and um, put it inside of an inkwell. So if you're interested in buying one of these first batch 12 bottles of ink, head over to my Instagram. I will be, you can just send me a message there. They are $6 plus shipping to wherever you're at. To order one, you can send me a message on Instagram or you can simply comment here with your Instagram handle and I'll message you if that's easier for you. But I put my, well, I'll put my Instagram right here, right now. I would love for you guys to use this ink and then, and get some feedback and see what you guys think. Also, I would love to see what you guys do with this. It feels like like my new little baby project. And it's just so exciting to see other people use the things that you loved and enjoyed making. But that is it for this video. You can now enjoy a beautiful montage and close up of me writing with the ink. I'll see you soon with another video and have a fantastic day. Bye.